Welcome to episode 16 of 28 Days of Color presented by Steam Engine Academy. Today's topic, color and dentistry. We'll explore the history of the black community in the dental field and talk with Elise Baugh, lead instructor at Carrington College in Nevada, who teaches dental assisting. Stay tuned. Ida Gray was born on March 4th, 1867 in Clarksville, Tennessee. She was an infant when her teenage mother, Jenny Gray, died. Her father, a white man, had no part in raising her when her mother died. She never knew her father, knowing only that he was white. Gray was sent to live with her aunt, Caroline Gray, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Caroline Gray was 35, uneducated, and unable to read or write when she moved from Clarksville, Tennessee to Cincinnati, Ohio in 1867 with her four children. In Ohio, Gray supported the family by working as a seamstress and housing foster children. All the Gray children contributed to the family's income. Ida, along with Caroline's three children, Howard, Susan, and Mary, attended the segregated public schools. Though she worked from an early age as a seamstress, Ida persevered with her schooling and graduated from Gaines Public High School in 1887 when she was 20 years old. During her schooling, Ida began working in the offices of Jonathan Taft, an early advocate of women being trained as dentists. The part-time job in the dental office was instrumental in her desire to become a dentist. Jonathan Taft had been the Dean of Ohio College of Dentistry and was recruited by the University of Michigan to help found their first dental school. When he left Ohio to take up the post, Taft kept an office with William Taft in Cincinnati. Ida worked in the office for approximately three years, learning enough to pass the entrance examinations for the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which she entered on October 1st, 1887. In 1890, Ida Gray Nelson Rollins graduated from the University of Michigan College of Dentistry. She was one of just three women in her graduating class and was the very first African-American woman dentist in the United States. Ida became the only African-American woman to ever have earned a doctorate of dental surgery in the United States at that time. Gray's accomplishment was widely published and she opened an office at 216 9th Street in Cincinnati. In her practice, she served both black and white patients and was repeatedly cited in black media as a role model for other women. In 1895, she relocated her practice to Chicago after marrying James Sanford Nelson in March of that year. He was a naturalized American citizen, originally from Canada, who was a lawyer, captain, and quartermaster for the Illinois National Guard. He later worked for many years as an accountant for the city of Chicago. As she had in Cincinnati, Nelson served both black and white clientele, as well as both adults and children, though her reputation was for her gentleness with children. She inspired one of her patients, Olive M. Henderson, to become the second black woman dentist in Chicago. Though her office relocated several times, Nelson continued to practice until her retirement in 1928. In 1929, Nelson, whose first husband James had died in 1926, married William A. Rollins. In addition to her dentistry, Nelson was involved in several clubs and her social activities were widely reported in the black press. She served as vice president of the Professional Women's Club of Chicago, vice president of the 8th Regiment Ladies Auxiliary, and was a member of the Phyllis Wheatley Club, a group organized to maintain the only black women's shelter in Chicago. On June 20th, 1944, her second husband died from injuries sustained in a motor vehicle accident. She did not have any children from either marriage and remained a widow until her death. Ida died on May 3rd, 1953 in Chicago, Illinois. She was 86 years old. An annual diversity award given in her name was established by the School of Dentistry at the University of Michigan. Though no comprehensive work has been done on a biography of Gray, she is often cited in works as an example of achievement and an inspiration for others to follow. Welcome back for another edition of 28 Days of Color. Today's topic, color and dentistry, has us speaking with Elise Ba at Carrington College in Las Vegas, Nevada. How are you, Elise? I'm good. It's so happy to be here. Thank you so much for including me. Thank you for participating. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. We want to know all about you. Let's start with where you are. Tell me what position you hold in dentistry and what are you doing currently? 
Uh, so I've been a dental assistant since 2017, so going on four years now. And uh, I, I am currently the lead uh, dental instructor here at Carrington College. So uh, I went from doing it, well, I started out as a teacher and then I switched over, um, I switched careers to dental assisting. Now I've taken my, my, my teaching and my dentistry and I've mushed them together. So I'm teaching dentistry. So I guess teachers never really get away from teaching. No, we don't. <laughs> And how cool that your teaching abilities have now morphed into your new career. Congratulations. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so what is your educational background in the field? Where did you start off? So I actually started here at Carrington College. I was a student at Carrington College. Uh, um, I became a student mentor, graduated with a 4.0. Um, and then after my externship, I started working as a dental assistant. Uh, you know, then uh, late last year, the college called me. I'm sitting up here thinking I still owe loans. I'm like, why are they calling me? Uh, but they, <laughs> but they actually called because they remembered that my prior career was as, um, uh, being a teacher. And so they saw it in my file. And so they were like, well, to be an instructor, you need teaching backgrounds and it need, and at least three years experience. Have you been doing dentistry since you left? I was like, yeah. So they were like, would you be interested? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's really cool. I actually keep these together. Oh, to find me where I started as a student and where I am now as an employee. So who thought I'd be back at my uh, alum, but uh, instead of in those desks, I'm in I'm in the front of the classroom now. Really cool, very. Thank, thank very you. Cool. And so, but what is something that's been challenging about your experience? That's a lot to do in three years. You know, nothing ever really, I don't see, I don't look at things as challenges. I see them as opportunities for growth or like opportunities to, uh, you know, expand. I'm like a forever student. So uh, instead of thinking about the, the challenges that came about, my, my opportunities for, uh, for growth was really around uh, patient education. What I didn't realize was how much of that uh, is on the assistant. For whatever the reason, people are very scared to talk to the actual doctor. They feel intimidated. And so a lot of the times the doctor will list off all the things they need. And then the doctor walks out the room and they go, what did he just say to me? What do I need? What do I need? <laughs> you know, so, so a lot of times, um, you know, you have to know how to kind of put it in layman's terms for the patient so that they can understand what's happening fully um, and do it in a way that you're not freaking them out. So that was probably my biggest hurdle because I'm a very direct person. I feel honesty is the best policy, but it's all in the delivery because sometimes, you know, you come back and you've scared them out of the chair. They're like, that's what's happening. And then they're like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you're like, oh. But uh, yeah, I think another thing is just kind of dealing with that angry black woman trope. Um, being in the medical field uh, made me more serious than I've ever been um, because it's just, everything is so important. I don't want people to get hurt. I don't want, you know, malpractice, things like that. Um, but in my attempt to be professional and to take the environment seriously, it also comes off that I'm a little, you know, aggressive or um, unapproachable or, you know, I basically ended up having the same type of intimidation as the doctors give off. And they're like, well, the doctors already do that. So you can't do that as well. You know, like you gotta find like a middle ground. Um, but yeah, you know, it's been, it's a different experience. It's more teamwork than I thought. You're working with all the people in your office every, like you, you talk to everybody every day. And that's very different from being a teacher where you spend a, most of the time in solitude. So 
Yeah. Right. With just you and your students. Right. And then when they leave, it's just me. You know what I mean? And, you know, they look to me, you know, and I don't have to go looking for people. So, yeah, the whole team dynamic is it's it, you're literally like on a sports team when you're in a dental office like really like you have to check in with everybody so yeah <laughs> so now about the black community since you've been in this field what are some major needs specifically for the black community that you've noticed as far as what we need dentally Whew. um so the stereotypical tropes need to stop there is a lot and it has spilled over from the medical field into the dental field. The idea that our, that our bone is denser and therefore it takes more to do things. The idea that, um, that our skin is thicker. And so people tend to have these same stereotypes in dentistry, like, oh, if it's a person of color, like, you know, you need to do this. It's like, no, no, that's not the case. And another thing is with oral pathology. In almost every book that I was, you know, using to research for my students in identifying different oral pathology, they're white mouths, you mm -hmm. know, with pink gums. And so things show up a lot easier. They're easier to see on lighter skin. Whereas like people of color, our gums tend to be melanated like our skin. They're brown, black, darker colors. We need photos of how they're supposed to identify abnormal cells or cancer, things, those type of oral pathology in the mouth with, within our skin tone, okay? How do you see redness when their gums aren't pink, when their gums are black oh. or dark brown? What is that going to look like, you know? And there's a lot of things that get missed because of that. You know, oh. it's the, there's actually a, a little boy, a high school boy that came out with the first um, skin pathology book for people of color. So instead of seeing eczema on white skin only, they're showing eczema on different shades of skin all the way to dark, dark brown, so that you know what it looks like on all these different skin tones. I'm not sure why these books have one skin tone when you're going to be working on people of multiple skin tones. And so here I am in dentistry, you know, something as simple as dentures, you know, being a black assistant, I was able to say to this man, would you like the gums pink? Do you want the gums brown so that your dentures look like you're And he was like, nobody ever asked me. I didn't even know we had more than, you know, pink as an option. Yes, they make gums that come melanated so you know and even the doctor you know when the dentures came in from the lab he was like oh look at these i said yeah i made it so it matched his mouth because he's black his mouth isn't he doesn't have bright pink gums like that you know what i mean and it's just things that people don't think about because they've never had to you know mm -hmm. and so that's what made me realize how important it was for me to be in dentistry to help and to be the voice for these patients who don't get to be in the lab when these doctors are having conversations and being like, actually, no, <laughs> like <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, actually, that's a stereotype. Um, you can actually do that procedure like you would any other procedure, you know, and things like that. So mm -hmm. I've never thought of that. Not. Mm -hmm. Or a, a gum, pink gums and brown gums. I mean, I know it, I recognize it, but I don't think I've ever really thought about it. Right. And especially right. when you're trying to recreate your smile, how impactful can it be to truly feel like you are reconstructing your own identity, not mm -hmm. trying to mirror someone else's? Yeah. Wow. It's something I, as simple as a band aid, you know? It's like, why do Band-Aids only come in one skin tone? You know, there's a company that just came out where you can, they have up to 20 different shades of Band-Aids and you can buy a box in your color if mm -hmm. you want, or a big old assorted color box if you have children, you know, so that if you do things with your hand, if you're a speaker and you happen to be a person of color, you don't have to worry about this, you know, this peachy Band-Aid on your finger, you know? So there's a lot of things that um, people weren't thinking about before that I, I can see in just the development um, 
of medicine and dentistry that people are trying to become more inclusive and start implementing you know these important factors when it comes to especially the cosmetic aspect of dentistry you know right and you know that's there at the dental office now in the black community at home what can we do to better implement some hygiene and dental practices at home think of it as preventative think mm -hmm. of dentistry as preventative you want to go so that you don't have to get work done okay if you wait till it hurts it's always more expensive and the process is probably not going to be the best and we can't guarantee that we'll be able to save your teeth come in when it's not hurting like really we would love to see everyone every six months to just get cleanings but because people don't see dentistry they don't think about the 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 mouth and body connection and so they don't come until things hurt oh something hurts now i'll go to the dentist for the first time in five years <laughs> no no don't wait until it hurts if you have insurance if you have the coverage even if you don't a lot of the basic stuff you can walk in zero insurance and pay 50 bucks for a cleaning in most places a lot of people don't know that you don't have to have insurance if you're going for the cheaper things if you're going for preventative stuff so I always tell people, if you have not gone to the dentist, go now, make your appointment right now. A lot of what's happening to our body has to do with what's going on in our mouth. You're not, you know, you haven't cleaned your teeth in seven years. You need a deep cleaning. There's stuff in your mouth called materia alba, which is a combination of both blood, mucus, saliva and food that you've eaten that accumulates below the gum line so you can't even see the collection of food it goes down into your gum so when you smile you don't see it it's they have to go down into your gums to dig it out but every time you drink water every time you eat food little tiny pieces of materia alba and bacteria you're swallowing it it's entering your bloodstream and so now you're trying to figure out where all these heart issues are coming from and things like that, all of a sudden you get your teeth cleaned, your blood pressure is going down, your cholesterol is going down, your heart issues are stopping. And then we show you this, you know, the napkin full of gunk that we took out of your mouth. You're swallowing those in tiny increments. If there's an infection in your mouth, a lot of people don't know that the things that they're tasting and the reason why they have issues tasting or why they feel like their breath smells has to do with the fact that their teeth aren't clean, that they need to go and get a cleaning, that they're not flossing. Oh my God, floss. <laughs> Everybody, do you have floss? Does somebody need floss? I have floss, would you like some? I just feel like I need a floss right now. Like just because, floss your teeth, people. <laughs> floss your teeth. I uh, Brushing your teeth is not gonna get the food out from in between it's not and it's and it's staying in there and that stuff is not only going to start eating away at your gums but it eventually eats away at your bone okay there's bone underneath your gums yeah okay there's bone under there okay and you can literally lose your bone level and you'll just start to notice one tooth is wiggling then then three then four and all these teeth are wiggling oh. and you're wondering why well your gums are still there but your bone you have bone recession so there's so it goes from being embedded into this much bone to only being embedded into this much bone your bone literally runs away from the bacteria it's like i don't want it i don't want it so your bone level will start to rise and rise and rise until your teeth are just kind of dangling in there mm -hmm. um yeah so no. floss so no. floss and go to the dentist you know Keep floss in your backpack or your purse. You're more likely to floss than if you leave it in the bathroom. That's right. another thing too, yeah. And you know, we went from the dental office and now we're talking about implementing these things in the home. What do you do when you go out into the community? What things have you done in the community to support dental hygiene? Well, there is um, a program that we, uh, that I was a part of when I was in PDS. It's called We Serve. And We Serve is a mobile dental group that, um, you know, targets 
homeless people and takes care of high end procedures. So we're not just doing cleanings, we're doing scaling and root planing, we're doing root canals, we're doing crowns and bridges, five, $6,000 procedures that homeless people would never be able to afford. People with jobs with no insurance can't even afford it, but we're doing it for people and families, not just homeless, but people in need, uh, people who have six children and none of their kids have been to the you know, dentist, they can sign up. We see all of them. We do cleanings on all of them. We do sealants on all of them, pulpotomies on whoever needs it. Um, we teach classes about healthy eating. We teach the kids how to properly brush, what proper brushing looks like, how to floss, how to properly floss. Y'all better stop using them slingshots to floss your teeth. This is the best. I'm so tired of seeing those slingshots because you know why? Because this is why I'm going to explain this. This is my tangent. I get one. All right. <laughs> you got a clean hand. You got a dirty hand. You need a long piece of floss so that as you floss, you're wrapping that nasty bacteria filled floss and you're exposing clean to the next one. So all uh -huh. y'all using them slingshots, you're picking up bacteria from here and then you're wedging it here and here and here as you go around your mouth. You're just picking up gunk and you're just, because you're using this same piece of floss over and over again, you're not cleaning it. So you're just transferring bacteria all in between your teeth and you think you're flossing and you're wondering why your gums are still bleeding. You need a long piece of floss so that as you floss, each tooth gets a new piece of thread. It's a clean piece. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, that is new information. I know, especially for really young children, they use those slingshots because it kind of helps them get the flossing idea down because mm -hmm. they can't necessarily manipulate the string that way. Yeah. But parents can certainly help so that they can use the, the proper floss. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know that all these commercials show you little kids brushing their teeth. Children shouldn't be left to brush their teeth on their own until they're like 12. There you yeah. go. And I have a set yeah, of toilet rolls. Yeah, I still they're not them. brushing. Yeah, yeah. You got to watch them and you have to help them brush. They're not brushing properly. Sure. Noted. And so with all the things that you've done in the community and in the office and with your own students at the college, what has been the most fulfilling aspect of being in this field? Uh, the most fulfilling aspect will probably be what got me in it in the first place. And that was my grandmother. Um, I remember telling her uh, that I was thinking about switching careers because, you know, as a teacher, they don't pay us what they should. Don't get me started on that. Anywho. So I'm telling her, yeah, I'm going to switch careers. And I was thinking about dentistry. And she said, oh, that would be good. You know, it's not a lot of black people in dentistry. Um, when I was a kid, I used to, we had to go to the vet. We had to go to the veterinary hospital to get our teeth removed. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, yeah. Black people had to go to the vet where the animals go to have uh, teeth extracted and, you know, procedures like that. So hearing that from her and she just say, you know, she said it like, this is what I did today. Very, you know, nonchalantly. Like, oh, that'll be good. Cause you know, it ain't a lot of black people in dentistry, you know? And you're just like. I'm sorry, I'm still at the vet. <laughs> right, 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 right. And she said it like it was just another day. Oh yeah, cause we used to go to, you know, we were sent to the vet. And I'm like, like we're animals, an like animal hospital? Like we're animal, you know? So you realize how much of an impact you're making, you know, that's the probably the most amazing thing about being black in America is that your presence is the impact. Just standing in a dental office means so much to my grandmother who didn't get to do that until she was an adult standing in a dental office, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just like, you know, you walk in the room and you're just like, yeah. And you see 
you know, other people of color kind of giving you that nod, like, yes, this, your presence is the present. It really is. You being here is that impact, you know? And, and, and every black patient that I work with, where I help them with things cosmetically or with the tooth shade or their gum shade or talking to them about bone density and things like that and making sure that they have a voice making sure that the doctor is acknowledging when they say they're hurt when they say something is uncomfortable like i love the fact that i can be that person i'm like she's already raised her hand and now she's saying it again doc we need to get her more numbing whatever no it's not working she said that already so i don't mind being that extra bump like you know what let me go get that for you Okay, because that's, I mean, whether it be medical or dentistry, one is, you know, people don't believe us when we say things. So it's nice to have somebody like myself standing there like, I heard you, I heard you, and we're going to take care of it. I'm going to write that down in the charts. I'm going to make a note of that in your charts for you. And they can look at me and really feel like, yeah, yeah, because I have someone here representing me, you know? Yeah, that's really that's, powerful. Yeah, man. Really powerful. Um, sure. no, but then, and with all that's going on, how has the pandemic affected your field as a whole and, and you? You know, it's interesting because, so I was actually able to work during the pandemic. I was, I was furloughed for four months, but then I came back as a frontline worker um, and we basically were only taking emergency patients. We were only allowed to take people that were in pain. But what that caused is there's some people who were regular, they came every six months to get their teeth clean. Well, they had to wait a year to come. They got cavities. Maybe some people that had cavities need root canals now. So there's a lot of patients who are upset because they're like, if I would have uh, been able to keep my appointment 10 months ago, would it have been a root canal? And you're like, nope, probably would have just been a filling. But here we are, you know? It's like, what do you want us to do? So you, there's just been a lot more um, patience with our patients, <laughs> understanding, being empathetic, trying to consider a lot of things. Um, people who are out of work, they lost their insurance, but their tooth is hurting. And we're still trying to help them anyway. It's like, listen, okay, let's figure out a payment plan. Let's figure out something. Because it's like, when they made their appointment, they had a job and in insurance. A week later, they don't. Does that make their abscess go away? Does their, you know, does the swelling go away? You know what I mean? So it's just, um, it's been, you know, being able to adapt and being able to, um, you know, extend an olive branch to a lot of patients where we wouldn't have normally done that because we know that there's just a need and it's not going to get better. It just gets worse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just doing what we can, where we can, when we can. Well, I appreciate hearing that. And I, you know, with the insurance thing, it's just horrible how it's kind of had a ripple effect on everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even with your three years in this field, you've packed in at least two decades worth of knowledge and experience. Well, so yeah. For someone coming into the field, someone who's inspired to try something new in the dentistry field, what is some advice you could give them? Um, the, well, the main advice is we need you. We need you. <laughs> Please be a part of the dental field. We need you here. Um, we need you to speak up. We need you to be doctors. We need more people of color working on people of color, have an understanding of what that looks like and what their needs are and that um, everything doesn't look the same. And, you know, so that's the main thing is just do it. Do it just like Nike, like do it, come on. Come on, we need you. You know, my second advice would be don't stop at being an assistant. Keep going. No. You know, you can become an assistant in less than a year. So keep going. Keep going. Be a dental hygienist. Be a doctor. You know, get to the point 
to where you can really call the shots because that's what we need yeah. uh, um, for whatever the reason um, as people of color uh, we just there's not enough of us in the managerial doctrine mm -hmm. area of things and so a lot of times we're doing what we can but we're still answering to a higher up we need to be those higher ups yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah so just do it and then don't stop that's my advice this has been an immense amount of information and i hope that everyone has the opportunity to rewind reflect and put a lot of what you've said into practice and floss <laughs> <laughs> don't make her say it again oh yeah not only that but another thing parents what you do for your children will help them later on down the line. All those appointments my dad used to make me go to and all that type of stuff. I am 34, I don't have a crown in my mouth. All my teeth are my teeth. I never had to wear braces. What you do for your children, it will, it helps them in the long run, you know? There's not a lot of people in their 30s that can say that they have all their teeth in their mouth, unfortunately. unfortunately. So. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and you know, I hope to have you back again. You did do some time with Steam Engine Academy teaching oral hygiene. Oh, I on class. Awesome. So I definitely look forward to having you again. And thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm like, thank you for being a friend. <laughs> share, a um, uh, share a smile with someone today, sister. Share a smile. Will do, Elise. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
onto his waves. Daddy, have you seen my bonnet? He looks around the sofa, but it's not there either. Where in the world could my bonnet be? I can't go to bed without it. Just then, my big brother walks in. A do-rag slipped over his locks. Does he know where it is? Big bro, have you seen my bonnet? He doesn't even pretend to look. He just says, ask grandpa. Oh, grandpa. My bonnet is now in its proper place and I'm really sleepy. Everyone gives me kisses and hugs and mommy and daddy read me a story. Good night, family. In the morning, when the sun comes up, our hair comes down. Daddy smooths his ocean-like waves. Mommy scrunches her ribbony curls. Sis unwinds her foot-long wrap. My brother shakes out his lovely locks. While Grandpa unsnaps her rollers, Grandpa shaves his head. As for me, my bonnet comes off and my braids come out. Now we're all ready for a brand new day. The end. One more hand. There's no... Yeah.